Why is this yelling at me? Good. Is this the time of day when I switch from saying good afternoon to good evening, or is either okay? Um, my name is Bill Baldwin. I'm currently serving as the, and I want you to emphasize this moderator, uh, the interim provost at Teachers College. Um, I'm delighted to be in that role, and I'm delighted to welcome you here. Um, let me start at the end um, and offer you a reminder that at the conclusion of this conversation, there is a reception immediately following um, in uh, the student lounge. Uh, if I left to go to the end of these brief remarks, I would probably forget, all right? So please do your best to join it. 100 years practicing a loud teacher voice whenever I get in front of a microphone, it's five times louder than it needs to be. Um, I'm actually very delighted to have an opportunity to invite, which I think is the 23rd iteration of this lecture series, Andrew Elliott to be the visiting professor and Tisch lecturer. Uh, I've checked in with most folks, I tend to stumble over professor this, doctor that, so I just like to use people's normal names and first names when I can. Um, I do want to offer some thanks. Um, this is an important joint effort to make this appointment work because it involves not just this lectureship, but it involves a year of engagement with faculty, students, and staff at the college. Um, so I do want to just give a note of thanks to a couple of folks. I'm looking around. I don't see. Work with me. <laughs> uh, Gary Natriello. <laughs> Gary Natriello, who is the chair of the Department of Human Development. We good? You I had it right the first time. There we go. Um, I want to thank everyone in the Department of Human Development for making uh, the experience of this visiting professorship as, as much fun as, and as productive as it's been. Um, of course, I want to thank Andrew for accepting the invitation. What many of you don't know is uh, the invitation was three years ago pre-pandemic, so we had a mild interruption in things showing up, but we got off to a great start. Um, I want to give a nod of thanks uh, and a little bit of history. The tis the Tisch Lectureship is a function of a gift from uh, an emeritus trustee, uh, Lori Tisch. Um, it has provided us for 23 years um, with the unbelievable opportunity to bring a raft of people to the college, uh, many of whose names you're going to recognize. Um, we posted Pedro Nogueira, uh, Derek Aldridge, Susanna Loeb, uh, Richard Rothstein, and Bettina Love. Um, Bettina Love recently joined the faculty of Teachers College uh, this past September. Um, this year we have the honor of hosting Andrew Elliott um, as the Sachs lecturer and the visiting professor. Um, I think in addition to the time we will have tonight to engage with Andrew, one of the things that strikes me as the important character of this program is the year-long engagement that it provides and from what I've heard from others in remarks Andrew has made, the mutual benefit of that engagement with faculty, students, um, other colleagues and staff throughout the college. Um, so what I want to do is give a, a quick tick, tip of the hat um, to some of the faculty who've so uh, willingly given of their time. Um, one is Zhao Dong Lin, um, who's a professor in cognitive studies and education. Uh, Bob Siegler, who is also a faculty member in Cognitive Studies and Education um, and is, the <coughs> is a previous Tisch visiting professor himself. Um, looking around, Jim Westaby in Social Organizational Psychology, um, my former current department. Uh, ben Lovett, who you will see in a little bit in School Psychology, uh, and a long list of others. So you get an idea of the cross-cutting nature and intersection, I talk with my hands, I'm sorry, um, of the kind of work that Andrew has done and the way it connects with the work that we do at the college. Um, what I'd like to do now, I'm sure you didn't come here to listen to me talk, 
um, is to turn this over to a student, Khan Yamane, uh, who is studying cognitive science in education um, for the introduction of Professor Andrew Elliott to you. Again, thank you all for being here and enjoy. I think I speak for all of us when I say that I'm excited for today's lecture and I'm truly honored to be given this opportunity to introduce Dr. Elliot. More precisely speaking, I should say I was excited to give this introduction until I realized that Dr. Elliot's CV, which he himself had so kindly given to me in preparation was this, for this, was over 50 pages long and at that point, it kind of felt like extra homework. But jokes aside, the long list of Dr. Elliott's achievements, awards, and publications really do speak for itself. He has close to 300 publications, which have been over 100,000 times, making him one of the most highly cited researchers in the entire field of psychology. He has given talks in a variety of institutions, including schools such as Cambridge, Oxford, UCLA, Shanghai University, and of course, Teachers College. He has received a number of prestigious awards, including the Distinguished Scientific Awards for Early, Mid, and Full Career Contributions, and the Jack Block Award for Distinguished Research. His famous contribution of the two-by-two -two model of avoidance approach achievement motivation is one of those beautiful models that has a natural and intuitive fit with prior literature and our daily experience, but at the same time, provides that fresh foothold in our endless pursuit to answer the question, why do humans act and behave the way we do? But we know all of this. Dr. Elliot is an amazing researcher. If you still have any doubts, you can do a brief search on the internet. But since he came to TC as a taste scholar last year and joined our lab at Epic Education for Persistence and Innovation Center, I've gotten to know him a lot more as a person. He is an explorer of the streets of Manhattan, a both happy and exhausted grandfather, and the husband of Mrs. Elliot, who I've never had the pleasure of personally meeting, but know makes amazing chocolate chip cookies. But above all, for me, he's been an invaluable and generous mentor. During the meetings we've had almost every week since last September in the lobby of Bancroft Hall, he has given me countless advice on my ongoing projects and also my career as an aspiring researcher. He has been firm in his commitment for us to make progress and has been patient during my attempt to share my thoughts and ideas, no matter how crude or unorganized they may be. I feel truly blessed to have been given this opportunity to work with a researcher and educator of this caliber, and I hope that today, especially for the students in the audience, will be an opportunity for us to learn from his wisdom. So, uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Andrew Elliott onto the stage. problem up here. There we go. So thank you. It's an absolute joy to be here. It's a real pleasure. I want to start by saying that when I was in college, I was a baseball player. And I know it's hard to envision me in this body and with these glasses as a baseball player. So I've got a prop. And my prop is a baseball hat. So better, right? <laughs> Now, yeah, now I look exactly like a baseball player, right? So I was a baseball player, and I really enjoyed the game, and I was pretty good at it. But 
over the four years I was in college, I found that I didn't perform up to my potential, and I kind of lost a little bit of interest in the game. So I took a step back and I wondered, why is that the case? While I was playing, and then especially once I stopped playing, I asked myself, what is it that led me to lose some of my interest and not perform up to my ability? The answer that I came up with intuitively was avoidance motivation. When I played, I would step into the batter's box. I'm going to use some baseball terminology. I hope that it, most of you, it resonates with most of you. I would step into the batter's box, and instead of trying to hit, get a hit, hit a home run or something, I would try not to strike out or not look silly when a pitcher threw a really good curveball. When I was out in left field where I played, I would try to not make mistakes or errors, as they're called in baseball, when the ball was hit to me. More broadly, I was concerned about not playing well enough to stay on the field, and I tried to avoid playing worse than my teammates who were sitting on the bench, chopping at the bit, waiting to get on the field. So basically, I was intuitively or intuiting that avoidance motivation led me to like the activity worse, like my baseball playing worse, and perform worse. I can get rid of this now. Um, I know it didn't work. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not delusional. Um, so sometimes, you might have heard the adage, research is me-search. And in this case, it's absolutely the case. Research is me-search. Because I proceeded to go on to University of Wisconsin and do my PhD in achievement motivation, and specifically achievement goal work and specifically, even, even more specifically, approach avoidance motivation. So the title of my talk today is Achievement Goals, the Classroom, I should add parentheses, the Ball Field, and Beyond. And I'm going to present some of the work that I've done over the last three decades after my baseball career was over. And most, much of it is grounded in the intuitions I had at that time. The key questions I'm going to ask today are what's the best way to be motivated in achievement situations, and what's the worst way to be motivated in achievement situations? This is the through line of my talk today. I'm going to, it's a touchstone. I'm going to come back to this repeatedly and answer this question for you. And at the end, I'm going to come out with clear conclusions around the answers to these questions. So this is my animating slide here. And let's talk about achievement situations. Achievement situations are everywhere. They're ubiquitous, I would argue. Anytime doing well or doing poorly is an issue, you've got an achievement situation. So the prototypes are sports, as I mentioned in my introduction, my early part of my introduction, sc uh, sports and work. Those are the, the prototypic achievement context. But there's another one I want to mention because it broadens the scope of what I'm talking about today, and that's hobbies, avocational pursuits. So I'm a walker. I walk in my hokas, right? And I'm, I walk every day. And I've made it into an achievement activity this year because I've got the goal of walking the streets of Manhattan, in fact, walking every single street in Manhattan during the year that I'm here. So I bought a map with the street, all the streets. I've got a highlighter. I'm highlighting when I cover ground. I'm five-twelfths of the way through my year. I'm about halfway through Manhattan right now. So, so far, so good. We'll see how it goes. But all to say, even hobbies can become achievement activities. And um, they're, they're, again, ubiquitous. They're everywhere that we turn. And in these situations, we tend to pursue achievement goals. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift gears to, from the kind of colloquial folksy introduction to start talking about the scholarly literature on this topic of achievement goals, OK? I'm going to start by defining achievement. Then I'm going to define goal. Then I'm going to put it together. And then we're off to the races, OK? So this is going to be a dense slide. I'm going to camp out here for a minute. Um, achievement is about confidence. And this is really important to grasp. Achievement's about confidence. And confidence is about doing well or doing poorly at something. And in order to know if you're doing well at something, ask yourself, if you're engaged in an activity, how do you know if you're doing well? How do you know if you're doing poorly? Well, you've got a standard that you use to determine if you're doing well or poorly. And that standard can be either a task-based standard 
or a self-based standard or another standard. And task and self-based standards are usually put together. Task-based standards is doing as well as the activity requires. A self-based standard is doing well relative to how one has done before or uh, how, well, how well, doing well relative to how one has done before. And I've got a cartoon to illustrate the self-based standard Self-improvement books, new and improved self-improvement books. And the other standard is others. So sometimes we don't try to improve or try to master a task. Sometimes we try to best other people or avoid doing worse than other people. That's an other-based standard. And here's an other-based standard in the world of grandparenthood, which is near and dear to my heart, as Khan mentioned. World's best granddad, they're, they're competing for that, uh, that title. Standard is one way to think about competence. It's one aspect of competence is the standard you use to determine if you're doing well or poorly. But the other thing we need to consider is the valence of competence. Is it positive? Are you focused on success or are you focused on the negative possibility of failure? And so this is also important to consider when we think about competence. And here is the illustration that refers to that play to win or play not to lose. You can focus on either one of those, and I think that it really matters, and I'm going to, I'm going to un unpack why it matters in my talk today. So that's achievement. That's defining achievement as competence. What about goal? What's a goal? Well, you have an intuitive idea of goal, but there's a technical way that we think about goal in the scientific literature, and I've sp I spent one... Um, one four-month period when I returned from one of my sabbaticals in the library reading old philosophical treatises on the concept of goal, doing an etymological deep dive, a historical deep dive. And what I came up with is basically that goal is a possible outcome, state, or object that guides behavior. And I won't bore you with the details of this treatise that came out of my four-month uh, deep dive, but I do want to share uh, one metaphor that I gleaned from this time, and it's the idea that goal is present in the Roman Forum from 2,000 years ago. So the goal is this and that pillar that are literally called goals in the Roman Forum, and the charioteer uses those goals to go toward the standard, the goal standard, and then once the charioteer gets to the end of the stand and reaches the standard or goal, the charioteer turns around, goes away from that goal, and toward another goal on the other side of the forum. So the, the, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that the, the idea of a guide, the function of being a guide, is part and parcel and central to the idea of a goal. So a goal is a guide, functions as a guide for your behavior. So let's put it together. Colloquially, an achievement goal is trying to do well or not do poorly at an activity. And it's often implicit. It's not that you wake up in the morning and list your goals and then pursue them. It's often that you have these goals and they're implicit until somebody like me gives a talk and then they become explicit for you. Or something happens, you get feedback, and then you think about that goal-relevant feedback in a new way. So they're implicit oftentimes, but they can be accessed easily and are explicit when we do access them. Here's the model that Khan, uh, Khan referenced. And it's the, um, it's the model that's driven a lot of the work that I've done. Not all of the work that I've done, but a lot of the work that I've done. And what it does is it puts together the two components to competence, the standard of competence and the valence of competence, into a model that spits out, if you will, or creates four different goals, that are each, each of which is a combination of one standard and one valence. Let me give you an example, and then I'll go through each of the four goals. So uh, look at the other column here, um, the other column. So we call those performance goals when you're using others as a standard. But you can use others as a standard on how to do well relative to others. That's the positive approach and success standard. We call that a performance approach goal. Or you can use others as a standard in a negative way. We, can, we call that a performance avoidance goal, which is try to avoid doing poorly compared to others. So let me go through each one of these goals in turn, and then I'll come back to that model again. Because it's so 
important for this talk. I'm going to come back to it again and speak to it again. So here are mastery-based achievement goals. Mastery approach goals are trying to attain competence relative to, to the task or the self. A mastery avoidance goal is trying to avoid incompetence relative to the task or the self. And then performance approach goals, as I just mentioned, trying to attain competence relative to others. Performance avoidance goals try to avoid incompetence relative to others. So back to the model. Again, each of these four goals are a combination of a standard and a valence. And I'm now going to talk about what two, two issues. First of all, what these goals lead to, in other words, what these goals predict. And then secondly, what leads to these achievement goals and the pursuit of these achievement goals. So antecedents and outcomes of these goals. And this is the first empirical study I'm going to present. I'm only going to present two empirical studies. This is a short talk. I wanted to make it kind of user friendly and not get bogged down in statistics. But this is one that I thought would be helpful to unpack the model and to show you how research in this, in this field is done. Not all research, but some research in this field is done. So in this paper, we, um, in this study, we had undergraduates um, in a psych class, 230 of them, or almost 230 of them. And we assessed their achievement motives. I'm going to talk more about what achievement motives are in a moment. Just know for now they're the antecedent that we focused on in this study. And then we assessed their goals for the exam. I'll show you the specifics in a minute of that. And then week 7 and 15, we assessed exam performance and enjoyment. Now, exam performance or performance and enjoyment are the two, we argue, gold standards for achievement outcomes. They're what you really want to attend to, to to know if achievement motivation is positive and beneficial or negative and not beneficial. So I told you I would unpack this need for achievement and fear of failure. These are two antecedents of achievement goals. Need for achievement is a socialized general tendency to want to work hard and desire to achieve. It's presumably grounded in early experience with success that parents rewarded. Fear of failure is the avoidant uh, companion to it. And it's the idea that sometimes we focus on the shame of failure that, again, is presumably grounded in the way that our parents responded to our failures and shamed us or punished us early on. So these are the two antecedents we focused on in this study. Here are the goal measures. This is going to help make concrete what I mean by these four goals. So in the classroom context, a mastery approach goal is my goal is to learn as much as possible. These are items in a scale. Mastery avoidance goals are my goal is to avoid learning less than it's possible to learn. And then performance approach goal, my goal is to perform better than other students. And performance avoidance goal, my goal is to avoid performing poorly compared to others. The outcome measures, we got the professor to give us exam grades. And then we measured enjoyment at the end of class with face valid items like, I'm enjoying this class very much. Now, before I show you the results, I want to, I want to step back for a minute. And I want you, to, you all to monitor, meta-monitor and process this talk at two levels. One is the concepts that I'm going over. This is a scholarly talk. It's an applied scholarly talk, but it's a scholarly talk nonetheless. I want you to apply at that, I want you to attend at that level. But I also want you to attend at the personal level. All of you are adopting achievement goals on a regular basis. All of you are doing so both personally and in your role as teacher, professor, student, parent, for example. So try to monitor it or, or attend at both of these levels. I think doing so you'll get the maximum value out of what I'm about to present in this talk. So here are the results from our study. We found that mastery approach goals, trying to learn as much as possible, led to more enjoyment. We found that mastery avoidance goals didn't predict anything. We found that performance approach goals led to better performance. And we found that performance avoidance goals led to worse enjoyment and worse performance. So I, I should have asked you to predict internally what you thought the relations would be and see whether you 
were right or not. But that's what we found in terms of the outcomes. Here's what we found for uh, antecedents. This is a busy slide, so I'm going to hone in on one part of it for you and help you interpret this. The idea here is need for achievement, this parental socialization around rewarding success early on leads to both mastery approach, mastery avoidance, and performance approach goals. Whereas fear of failure, the socialized tendency to shame a child when a child fails, leads to mastery avoidance, performance approach, and performance avoidance. Here's what I want to highlight. Here's the, here's the thing to really hone in on. Mastery approach goals are pure approach in the sense that they're grounded in need for achievement only and not fear of failure. Performance avoidance goals are grounded in fear of failure only, not need for achievement, so they're pure avoidance. The other two, mastery avoidance and performance approach, are admixtures or combinations of to an approach and an avoidance tendency. So here's the, the big picture. Again, I'm not going to take you through each and every path. Um, what I really want to highlight here is that mastery approach goals, trying to do well compared to the, how the, what the task demands or how you've done in the past, are the best goals in terms of both the antecedent, their pure approach, and the outcome. They lead to a good outcome, enjoyment. Performance avoidance goals are the worst form of motivation here in that they come from avo an avoidant place of fear of failure alone, and they undermine both performance and enjoyment. So we've got our, a marker in, we've, I, I planted a flag here, one answer or the answer that we're going to give to that question that I posed early on, what's the best and what's the worst achievement motivation? Right now we've got an answer of mastery approach is best, performance avoidance is worst. So I'm going to now fill in the literature for you. I just showed you a st one study that I did. This model has generated literally over a thousand um, studies from other people as well across the world. And so I'm compiling in the next many slides what the literature looks like when you compile it. Okay. And so in addition to intrinsic motivation and or enjoyment and performance, mastery approach goals lead to long-term, not necessarily short-term performance. They lead to more concentration, less distraction, effort and persistence, low anxiety, positive emotional experience. A bunch of good stuff. So mastery approach goals have been shown across the literature to lead to good outcomes. Performance approach goals lead to short-term performance, but not necessarily long-term performance concentration, effort, and persistence, but also, those are positive things, but also negative things, specifically anxiety, upset stomach and physiological symptoms, unwillingness to seek help, and cheating behavior. So they're a mixed bag. They get you some good, some not so good. Mastery avoidance goals, we're going to see a recurrent theme. These are hard to understand, both at the outcome level and the antecedent level. They seem to predict anxiety and specifically physical, physiological symptoms and perfectionism and procrastination. I'm not going to dwell on that much further. I really want to hit this slide hard. Performance avoidance goals lead to anxiety, both worry, cognitive worry, and physiological symptoms, low concentration, self-handicapping, which is intentionally putting obstacles in the way so you have an excuse when you fail. Sounds crazy. But that's how strong avoidance motivation is. It makes you do crazy stuff like that. Negative emotional experience, unwillingness to help quitting. The bottom line is this is a disaster. When you adopt performance avoidance goals, it leads to all kinds of negative possibilities. So here's summary number one around outcomes. Mastery approach goals lead to positive outcomes and experience. They're the best. Performance avoidance goals lead to negative outcomes and experience. They're the worst. The other two goals get you a mixed bag. OK? Now let's talk about the antecedents. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So positive temperament is a biologically ingrained kind of foundational propensity to focus on positive possibilities. 
they lead to mastery approach goals. That, that temperament leads to mastery approach goals. Self-efficacy is just confidence in you can do it. That leads to mastery approach goals. Growth mindset. So some of you know Carol Dweck's work. Many of you probably know Carol Dweck's work. Growth mindset is the idea that you can improve your ability over time with effort, right? And so growth mindset leads to more mastery approach goals. Classroom emphasis on improvement leads to more mastery approach goals. So again, a very positive antecedent profile. Performance approach goals lead, are, come from positive temperament, self-efficacy, much like their mastery approach counterpart, but also a fixed mindset. So this is Carol Dweck's idea of some people feel like you've, you're born with a certain amount of intelligence and that's it. And this mindset is what predicts performance approach goals. So that's a problem for performance approach goals. A classroom emphasis on social comparison, and then income inequality. Um, I've got other slides at the end of my presentation that I could present on that if you ask about it in a Q&A. Just planting a seed here. Um, and then what else leads to mastery avoidance goals? Negative temperament, growth mindset, classroom emphasis on improvement. And then more importantly, what else leads to performance avoidance goals? Negative temperament, low self-efficacy, a fixed mindset, a classroom emphasis on social comparison, income inequality. Again, a raft of negative antecedents lead to performance avoidance goals. So here's our other summary about antecedents. Mastery approach goals are grounded in positive dispositions and situational emphases. Performance avoidance goals are grounded in negative dispositions and situational emphases. Again, the answer to the question of what's the best, what's the worst achievement motivation for both outcomes and antecedents, we've got a clear answer. It's mastery approach goals, trying to do well compared to what the task demands or how you've done in the past, and performance avoidance goals are the worst, right? Trying to do, uh, avoid doing worse than others is problematic. So that's kind of the foundation. That's, I've laid the foundation of what I wanted to convey to you, and we've already got a really important, I would argue, take home message for you on which goal is best, which goal is worst to pursue in your role as teacher, professor, doctor, parent, or just person with a hobby. Now I want to focus on the one other study and one other topic that I'm going to present today, and that's the idea of meta-motivation. And this is directly relevant to where we are in the talk right now, because right now we've got a really good goal and we've got a really bad goal and the question I'm going to ask here is, do people have the meta-motivation to know which goal is good and which goal are, is bad? You know now, if you're paying attention to me, you know you've got very good meta-motivation about these goals. But do people in general know which of these goals are good and which of these goals are bad? Do they know mastery approach is good and performance approach is bad? Um, Here's another cartoon, not our worst, uh, our worst employee, just the same, it's nice to get an award. So it's probably not the ideal award, which again, highlights performance avoidance, ah, not so good intuitively. So the question we're gonna ask in this study are do people know what achievement goals are good and bad for academic performance? And, in, and the second question is about good and bad, do they know what's good and bad for enjoyment? The big two again, the gold standard outcomes, do people know what is best and worst for the gold standard outcome? So here's the study, it's actually just submitted, it's not, it's fresh, it's so fresh it's not even hatched yet, it's not published yet. So this is new data that I wanted to share with you. It's an online study of over 300 kids, 300 participants. So within subject design, all that means it's a, it's a fancy way of saying all of the manipulations I'm gonna show you, everyone saw in the study. And participants in this study read about different types of students, and then they were asked to guess which achievement goals these different students would pursue. And so there's four manipulations. The performance best student read, to what extent do you think each goal statement is true for the student who performs the best in his or her classes? And then with the worst student, to what extent do you think each goal statement is true for the student who performs the worst in his or her classes? And then we did the same thing for enjoyment, right? Who enjoys their class the most? Who enjoys their class the least? And every time we gave this manipulation, we asked them to fill out the achievement goals that that student would, uh, would adopt. 
We um, measured performance approach goals with my goal is to perform better than other people. My uh, performance avoidance goals, my aim is to avoid performing worse than other people. We didn't measure per, uh, mastery goals in this study. It's a limitation to this study. We've gone on to do so in subsequent work. I'll say more about that in a minute. But let me show you the results. So with regard to performance approach goals, participants thought the best performing student would have more performance approach goals than the worst performing student. Bingo, they got it. Their meta motivation is accurate. They're accurately intuiting that performance approach goals are a, a relatively good form of motivation, at least uh, uh, relative to performance avoidance goals. Performance avoidance goals, on the other hand, they thought the best performing student would have more performance avoidance goals than the worst performing student. And I've highlighted this, I bolded this, because why? That's wrong. And it's wrong in a really important way. It's wrong in a way that's going to cost you down, downstream if you adopt these, these particular goals. For enjoyment, performance approach goals, they thought the student who enjoyed the, the um, class the most would have more of them than the student who enjoyed it the least. That's commensurate with the literature. And then performance avoidance goals, they also got right. The student who enjoyed it the least, the class the least, they thought would, in, uh, would uh, endorse more performance avoidance goals than the student who enjoyed it the most. So the bottom line here, the summary statement here, do people know what achievement goals are good and bad for academic performance? Not really. The answer is no to this. They think the best student has stronger performance avoidance goals than the worst student. Houston, we've got a problem. People don't know that performance avoidance goals are problematic for performance. However, for enjoyment, people understand that performance avoidance goals undermine enjoyment. They have an intuited sense that trying to avoid doing poorly compared to others is problematic. So I'm nearing the end here. I just want to say a few words about intervention. So we now know Mastery approach goals are the best form of goal pursuit in achievement situations. Performance avoidance goals are the worst. We know that people have somewhat of an accurate sense around enjoyment. They know that performance avoidance goals are problematic, but they get it wrong around performance approach goals and performance avoidance goals and performance. So what then? What do we do as individuals? What do we do as teachers and parents and what have you? So the first statement I'm going to make is the most obvious and the straightforward. Given what I've presented to you today, one thing to do is to try to teach people under our charge which are the best and worst achievement goals. It's what I'm doing today with you. I'm giving you information that's valuable to your achievement strivings when you walk out of this, this wonderful room that we're in. Second and third, though, are more complicated. I think that we need to address the dispositional antecedents of achievement goals and the address the situational antecedents of achievement goals. And I'm going to get a, give you a slide for each one of these, and then I'm going to wrap up. So regarding the dispositional antecedents, remember, these goals are grounded in dispositions that are hard to change. So one disposition is fear of failure. The tendency to walk into an achievement situation and be concerned about the shame of failure and then try to avoid and protect accordingly. This is really hard to change. This is grounded in early socialization experience. And so I ran across this book, and, and I, I probably shouldn't do this to the author. I mean, I hope none of you know the author, but I'm going to trash the book a bit. I haven't read it, caveat, I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm going to say that when I read the title, I'm suspicious. I'm a little bit wary. So conquer your fear of failure. Escape your comfort zone. Overcome anxiety. Take action despite being scared. And reinvent a fear fearless you. I'll confess, for me, this feels too simplistic. It feels like fear of failure is way more embedded, way more complicated than that sounds. Again, apologies to the author, but that is not commensurate with my view of fear of failure, which is more akin to this. What stops you from overcoming your fear of failure? My fear of failure and trying to overcome my fear of failure. So fear of failure is embedded, it's deep, and it takes 
long-term work to change in order to not adopt as many performance avoidance goals that fall naturally out of the fear of failure. So I think if one has resources, therapy is a good way to address that. If one doesn't, just the knowledge and then the knowledge that there's long-term work involved and persistent work on trying to understand that failure isn't necessarily shameful is, is warranted here. But in the present, while you're doing that long-term work, all is not lost. I think we can encourage people to pursue performance approach goals in the service of fear of failure, which also, they also emerge out of fear of failure, instead of performance avoidance goals, which are entirely problematic. So this is the idea that you can approach success, try to do well compared to others, in order not to fail. That's a weird combination, but if you think about it, it makes sense. If you're afraid to fail, you can walk into a situation and either Try to avoid failure directly, or you can try to succeed so that you don't fail. And I would argue that that latter combination is better than the former. Finally, situational antecedents. Here we have more purchase. It's easier to attend, relatively easier to attend, to situational antecedents of these goals and to attend to them. So, for example, the classroom emphasis, right? Classroom emphasis is going to lead to certain kinds of achievement goal adoption. So our aim when we focus on changing classroom emphases should be on decreasing avoidance goals and increasing mastery approach goals as we now know. And one way to, change, one way to do this is to change the emphasis from avoiding mistakes in a classroom setting to mistakes are a way to learn. We can try to encourage students to think differently about failure, not as something to avoid, but it's kind of the grist of the mill of learning, if you will. And then uh, another statement we could, another uh, statement I'd like to make here is we can try to change the emphasis for teachers in the classroom from social comparison to self-comparison. That would increase mastery approach goals and reduce performance avoidance goals. I've got a last cartoon here, state intelligence test today. Before we get started, the principal wants to say a few words about the importance of doing well today. He's saying beat others and beat other schools. He's smiling, he's doing that grin. Look at the faces of the students, right? They get it. They know that they are in trouble in terms of if they don't do well, it's going to be a shameful experience. So they're most likely going to be adopting performance avoidance goals. We want to stay away from that and encourage uh, not social comparison, but self comparison. Last slide. My final, conclusion, my final conclusions are as follows. I would argue that this two-by-two two model, objectively, based on citations, as Khan said, is, is a major advance in the literature. And I say that humbly as a scientist who has worked with other scientists to develop these kind of ideas. And what I think this model does is it moves from a focus on the amount of motivation. When you think about motivation, we talk about motivation at a lay level with other people. It's probably, are you mo is the person motivated or not? Is my kid motivated or not? It's a quantity of motivation that we focus on. I'm arguing that's crude and it's not nuanced enough. And what the two by two model brings to the table is more nuance. And it's that these, it's a quality of motivation that matters, not just the quantity. So some kinds of goal pursuit and some kinds of motivation are good mastery approach, and some are problematic, performance avoidance. And then my take home message is exactly this again, and I know I've hit on this over and over again, but my guess is you're not gonna forget this soon because I've hit on it so many times. And it's the take home message is pursue mastery approach goals and try to avoid per, uh, and, and not performance avoidance goals. So try to introspect in your vocation, maybe as a teacher, maybe as a student, maybe on the ball field, right? Or maybe avocationally, encourage, hang out with people, work toward mastery approach, and do the opposite with performance avoidance. And the very last thing I'm gonna say is, one other reason this is important is that one of the predictors of performance avoidance goal pursuit 
is being an underrepresented minority or a first generation student. So this is high stakes, not like the cartoon, but high stakes for a different reason. And it's important to understand the implications of performance avoidance goals and do something about them. A few thank yous to Provost Bill Baldwin and Deidre, his uh, wonderful executive assistant who's helped me in various ways throughout the year thus far. My, collaborator, my collaborators, I want to thank Xiaodong Lin, uh, an extremely generous human being who uh, it's been just a joy to be with uh, this year thus far. Bob Siegler, uh, who I disagree with on just about everything that I've talked to him about. And I've been sharpened by that. I hope he has. If he listens to this, sorry, Bob, but you know it's true. Um, Jim Westaby, I think Jim is here. There he is. Um, we've just started to collaborate. It's an absolute joy to both hang out with him and have sushi with him and to start to do some research with him as well. My colleagues, who I've gotten to know a little bit, but I look forward to getting to know better over the next couple of months, Ben Lovett, who you're going to see in a minute, and Tyler Watts. Um, TC is in good hands here, um, with, with them here. If you can retain them, TC is in good, in good hands with those two really, really brilliant uh, pr professors. And then I, I just want to shout out to the Residential Services uh, Director, uh, Elizabeth Greenlee. She's done... Um, a lot for my wife and I, and then Bancroft Hall. I would be remiss if I didn't shout out to both uh, Anderson and Jose, who are respectively uh, security at Bancroft Hall and um, custodial staff. Uh, you know, it's the everyday interactions that make life really good or not so good, and those two guys make life really, really good. So thanks to all of them, and thanks to you for listening, and I look forward to the Q&A. Appreciate it. No, thanks very much, Andy, for the kind words. It's also been great to get to know you a bit and hope to get to know you more. Uh, your talk raised so many interesting questions for me, and I also thought it was very, very clear even if you were out in left field when you were playing baseball, you certainly were not tonight, so that was great. Um, I would encourage folks to uh, make your way up if you like to the microphones, um, but just to, to, I have so many things <laughs> to kick things off, and I added during your talk things that I was thinking about, but one I'm going to start with isn't even listed here. It, this is the first time that I have heard the two by two goal matrix described in a way that adds so much nuance to our colloquial way of saying, someone's not motivated enough. And it makes me wonder, do you find folks who on your scales have low levels of all four goals? Do you find yeah. folks who have low motivation regardless of what type it is? Yeah, that's a great question. You know. Usually not, and the reason usually not is that they usually select themselves yeah. out of the kind of achievement situation we're in. So we do a lot of studies in the classroom <laughs> at my college, and those people that are low on all of those end up not showing up in college. That makes sense. So it may be a selection effect. Selection so, effect. Exactly. No, thank you. Uh, please, sir. Right yes. Hello, Professor Elliott. How are you? I'm good. How are all you? All right. All right. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jeffrey Omar Patrick. I am a doctoral candidate in the Department of Health and Behavior Studies. I'm also an assistant professor at New York Medical College in the Department of Medicine. And I came here today to ask you a very important question. Yeah. Why did the chicken cross the road? Uh, <laughs> beyond my pay grade. So, I so. OK, well then. It was avoidance motivated because somebody was chasing him. I, I don't know. I mean, I was... Anyway, I thought of another question while I was listening to your presentation that I think that you're probably the one to ask this question. If you could tell us all, what do you think is the phenomenon or the thing that governs our motivation? In other words, what motivates us? Is it something we're born with or is it something that we're learned? 
So that's a small question. Uh, no, that's, that's, a, that's a huge question. And I think the best way to answer that is that it's, it's not nature or nurture, it's both, right? So we're born with some propensities that are motivationally relevant. We're also socialized into certain other propensities. And then content-wise, to the extent there's been taxonomies developed, three types of motivation are particularly uh, salient for uh, across cultures. One is achievement motivation. We care about competence. Another is, you could probably guess, relatedness motivation. We care about connecting to others. And the, other, and the third, and I think this is a little bit less central than the first two, is, is autonomy. We care about being self-determined and having uh, ability to control our own fate. So that's the best I can do under the circumstances of, of I mean, we could, I'd love to sit down with you and unpack that, but that, that would be my answer to your question. I've got a ton of questions, but I know that you know, we're here. Uh, but when it comes to, when it comes to motivation, the idea that really like perplexes me is is motivation really something that everyone is born with that's what i would like to know yeah. that's what's really like because here at columbia university of course everyone is motivated at yeah. a certain level but outside of the doors you come across different yeah. people different motivation yeah. And, and when I try to get, like, I, I have boys. I have four boys. And when it comes to schooling, right, when it comes to schooling, I find that I got a few that likes, you know, they're motivated to go to school. And then some of them I, like, got to really sit down and say, you have to do this. You yeah. have to do that. Yeah. And, I, and I'm thinking, is, is, it, is, it what, is it what some people are born with? Yeah. Or is it? You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So, well, let me, uh, let me speak. Thank you for the question. And, and four boys, uh, yeah, yeah, you must be tired. <laughs> um, so I'm going to speak to achieve, the achievement motive and, me, and, and the, the achievement motivation because it's my specialty. And so if you look at an infant, right, an infant is always testing their environment and they're engaged in their environment, and most psychologists think what they're trying to do is master their environment and explore their environment and learn about their environment, right? So in the achievement motivation field, we, we call that effectance motivation, that we're born with this natural tendency to try to explore and master the environment. As we go through childhood and become proto-adults and then adults, Things get a lot more complicated, obviously, because we've got that initial organic achievement motivation, but in comes a parent like yourself rewarding some things and punishing other things. That becomes then a combination of nature and nurture, and that dance takes place over the many, many years of socialization. I hope I started to address your question. Very much. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, my field that I'm looking into is entrepreneurship education. Mm -hmm. And in entrepreneurship, I guess being masterful at the task is performing mm -hmm. well. And in, for example, in this situation, and I imagine there are a lot of similar situations, uh, what, how do you see kind of the intertwinement between mastery and performance? And uh, what should educators do to distinguish different types of uh, motivations? Great, thanks. So I'm going to distinguish between um, mastery approach, performance approach, and performance avoidance goals. I, I would argue that performance avoidance goals are rarely, if ever, beneficial in the kind of context, anyway, that you're describing. 
But I do think that mastery approach goes trying to do well compared to how you've done in the past or mastering tasks, coupled with performance approach goals of trying to do well relative to others in an entrepreneurial setting which is inherently competitive makes a heck of a lot of sense. So it's motivation is context specific. And in some context, pure mastery approach is probably the best. My walking a vocational goal of walking Manhattan doesn't make any sense for me to try to compete with somebody else about that. It's pure mastery approach. But in an entrepreneurial setting where you have to attend to how others are doing or you're in trouble, I would argue performance approach and mastery approach in conjunction is probably the best form of motivation. I would still argue stay away from performance avoidance goals because they're, they're death. Okay? Hi. Hi, I'm Anupriya. Um, I'm a master's student in the spiritual psychology program here at TC. And uh, I had like two comments and a question. Uh, the first is that um, since a very young age, I've been very drawn towards music. I'm also a musician. I uh, produce and DJ electronic music. Uh, and I'm from India where that's like a little unusual sometimes. And uh, growing up, what I noticed was I had to kind of really fight to go to my music lessons and classes and how to always justify why I'm doing this. And what I always heard was that creativity is for the gifted and you know, we're like average people who do like more academic things. And this is like, you can only master creativity if you're born with it. And that would often also lead me to have a lot of performance avoidant goals like, oh my gosh, everyone's better than me at this. And I would often give up, but I always came back to it because of passion. And now I feel much closer to having achieved a lot of my music goals, having realized that like being passion driven is really what makes you break yeah. into that growth mindset. So, so there's a lot of relati relatability there. Then on the spirituality aspect, um, not just from my program, but I've also been really spiritual and it's very common in the spiritual world to ask like your intention behind something and the why being important. Mm -hmm. And this idea that, okay, so you will manifest this if the reason that you want it is like a pure intent and if it's for the greater good. Or like in my Buddhist practice, it's very important to connect your personal goals to like Kosin Ruhu, which is like world peace and, and the greater good. And how when you connect your personal goals to the greater good, like you know the, the manifestation process is a lot more energetic and powerful. So I feel like there's been some recognition of this in cultures already, the intention part. And I saw a lot of the intention come out, like the why are you doing this for society versus, mm -hmm. you know, other things. And this takes me to the social comparison theory aspect. I was recently working on a paper on the evil eye and envy. And uh, there's this idea of envy being compartmentalized in uh, these categories of malignant envy and benign envy. And uh, when, the, when envy is benign, it's supposed to help with motivation because it, ins it inspires you. And when it's malignant, that's when it like goes against that threshold of where it's healthy and really inspires you. So I feel like to add another layer of nuance, there's, I believe, situations where performance avoidance can yeah. help you grow and take you closer to you know, your uh, achievement. Whereas if it's like malignant envy and if it's like too driven by comparison, then it's an inhibiting factor. Yeah. Mm. Sort of a curvilinear <laughs> relationship, you know? Sorry? Sort of a curvilinear relationship maybe where there's a initial okay. some. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what I'm gleaning from what you just stated, which is, which is a lot, and it's very interesting, is that it's important to not only think about the goal that you're pursuing, the four goals that I covered here, but also the reason why you're pursuing those goals. Mm -hmm. So for example, the same goal of try to do well compared to others can look very different if you're wanting to pursue that goal in order to experience the joy of success, which is repetitive and positive all the way through, or if you're trying to do well compared to others in order not to fail, mm -hmm. right? So you're bringing up things like creativity as a pure reason for engaging in mastery pursuits. Mm -hmm. You're bringing up spirituality and wanting to um, connect to a, a higher power, for example. Mm -hmm. That can lead you to engage in mastery approach goals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I fully agree with you that there's more nuance here that I didn't have time to get into, yeah. but it's goals aren't the end of motivation. They're the, 
well, let, me, let me rephrase that. Goals are the end of motivation, meaning the most proximal thing that predicts your behavior, but there's reasons, there's whys behind them that lead to them that I touched on a little bit today that really, really matter. So I think your insights are right on track on that. Thank you. Uh, what about the envy bit? Uh, the malignant and benign part? Uh, we, might, we might disagree a bit on performance avoidance goals being optimal in that context. I would, I would press that a little bit and ask if there's another way other than performance goals that you can cope with that, mm -hmm. that envy. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be a broader discussion. I'm, I'm just, you can tell I'm pretty anti-performance avoidance yeah. goals. <laughs> the one place I think the jury's out is low resource context. So I, I do work, I've do, done work in Haiti for about 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's an extremely low resource context. And one study I really want to do is get, get my goal measure into some schools in Haiti and see if performance avoidance goals, trying to avoid doing poorly compared to others, or mastery avoidance goals, which are a good match to the low resources of the, of the context might actually not be bad or even be good because of the match to context, yeah. the low resource context. So maybe I'll, I'll give an inch on that, but I'm not gonna give any further than that. That's a now. lovely perspective. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Pat. I'm the education and neuroscience um, program, and I had to write down my question because I'd forget it. Um, no so, um, I was a primary school teacher before I came here, and obviously that context is a lot different when you're talking mm -hmm. about goal setting, and um, we talk a lot about growth mindset in the classroom, and that gets taught to kids a lot. Um, however, when it comes to goal setting, there is often just like a routine of like, write down your goals, and of course, if like a teacher's overlooking your shoulder, they're going to be yeah. performance approach goals. Yeah, yeah. So, my question is, um, given that situation, uh, student motivation might not align with the goals that they're setting the way that you described it. Like, they might write down a performance yeah. or a mastery achievement goal, yeah. but they might feel something different. Um, so, do you think Two questions, I guess. Do you think it's good practice to have students write down their goals? And what are some things that you think primary school teachers should focus on to help build that mastery achieve, mastery approach goal setting in, intrinsically? Yeah. So do I think it's a good idea for um, teachers to encourage to, students to write down their goals? I do. I personally would use this two by two model and teach kids about the benefits and costs of each of the different kinds of goals, and maybe writing them down reinforces that and encourages them to move toward mastery approach goals away from performance avoidance goals. You touched on, though, the veracity of those goal reports. Of course, there's social desirability present, and when students realize, even when you explicitly state, mastery approach is great, performance avoidance is problematic, when they write their goals down, they're probably going to try to please you, right? So you would also want to encourage them to be as honest as possible and talk about the benefits of honesty in that regard. So um, that's the first question. The, the second question of, of how to encourage mastery approach in the classroom. Um, Start, starting with like, you know, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Like. Yeah, so I think that's the default, that kids are naturally mastery approach. They're, from an attachment theory perspective, they're naturally looking to master and explore the environment. So I think we often get in the way by giving grades earlier than they maybe need to be, or, or if not just giving, but emphasizing grades. Comparison with the principal in that cartoon, right? Of We got to do well relative to other schools, et cetera. So I, I would say first, get out of the way mm -hmm. and let kids' natural motivation take its course. But then also, I think build in resilience. Build in resilience with messages around failure is okay. Failure is the grist of the mill of learning, right? Zhao Dong Lin here is, has a whole center focused on mistakes are okay, right? And so I think that kind, applying that kind of work to that context is really valuable. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the, uh, for the presentation.
presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, more straightforward. Um, so I'm very curious about the empirical study that you mentioned. Do you mind sharing a little bit about the distribution of the four groups of people? And, um, and what are the characteristics of the people with mastery approach uh, mindset, like their cultural background, demographics, stuff like that? Yeah. Um, and the second question would That's be- That's two questions already. Oh. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Oh uh, yeah, so like subgroup analysis. Um, and the second part is um, as much as uh, we wanna be uh, to acquire this mastery approach mindset, I feel like often people find it uh, difficult to have a consistent self-evaluation and uh, assurance. So I'm just wondering how, what are some like, I guess, tips of tricks for having <laughs> like a consist consistent objective uh, anchoring of yourself so that when you're comparing it to yourself, it's the same self that you're comparing to. Yeah, yeah. So the first question is about the distribution of the goals. We typically see mastery approach the highest and then performance approach right nearby there. So on a one to five scale, five being high, you often get into the low fours for mastery approach to high threes for performance uh, approach. Mastery avoidance, I'm gonna just hand wave away. That's it, 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 a whole different discussion because in classrooms that are not as relevant for older people like myself, they're absolutely relevant. It's all about what am I, am I what am I losing today that I, I you know, I, those of you who are a little bit older might resonate to that. And then performance avoidance is usually around the, the midpoint of the scale. So it's below the two mastery approach and performance approach goals. Is that veridical or is it due to social desirability? We often use social desirability numbers and control for that when we're looking at the predictive utility of the goals. So we think that, that there's some social desirability in there, but for the most part, those are pretty accurate kind of rank orders of where the goals um, un, uh, unfold. Um, remind me of the second part of the first question. Uh, it was, uh, what are the characteristics of people with a mastery approach mindset? Uh, the characteristics, they're... they're like a demographic information. I oh, think demographics, yeah, yeah. okay. So uh, the demographics, um, there's not nothing really uh, striking about the demographics is the demographics that really pop out are for the avoidance goals, especially performance avoidance goals. And I mentioned it's underrepresented minorities, people in low resource context, interpersonal cultures, um, like East Asian cultures. Um, um, yeah, those kind of things. Mastery, mastery approach goals, demographically, um, I would say younger kids are more mastery approach oriented. Uh, males are slightly more mastery approach oriented. Females are more performance avoidance oriented. Not a huge difference there, but th that's, a, that's a difference for sure. And then, re sorry, remind me of the, 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 second, the second question. Uh, yeah, so how do we have a consistent uh, benchmark? Right, right. So I think part of the inconsistency around motivation is that relational factors impact motivation. So if one has secure attachment, for example, so I'm a big attachment theory guy. If you're securely attached to your parents through socialization, they were there for you, they were responsive when you needed them to be, they let you explore when you came back, they were receptive. That I think leads to a stable mastery approach motivation over time. If you have insecure attachment where there's either anxious attachment or, or um, ambivalent attachment, anxious ambivalent attachment or avoidant attachment, where your parents weren't really there for you when you came back after exploring, or they were clingy, or, or various forms of um, insecure attachment. I think that's what leads to the, the, the vicissitudes of especially approach motivation. That's where it's hard to stay exploration-based when you've got this nagging concern about, if I get into trouble here, is my parent gonna be there ready for me to give the refueling and the energy and the reassurance that I need. So that would, for me, that would be one really strong predictor of motivation going up and down and often um, having difficulty. It would be low uh, insecure attachment. Thank you, I love the association to attachment theory. I'm also a big fan of that, thank you. 
I think we have time for uh, one more question. Is, is anyone else? Please. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's my first time hearing the two by two model. It's very inspiring. And before this lifetime, more for me always, um, the concept of intrinsic motivation versus the uh, extrinsic or e external motivation, say, uh, primary school kids, they learn because they think it's fun versus another kid who learned because his mother expects him to do all stuff in, yeah. in school. And I, I wonder how the intrinsic, um, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation for the two, two by two. Right, so good question. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that extrinsic motivation, right? So parents praising you for doing well or punishing you for doing, poor, for doing poorly is gonna lead to performance-based goals and especially avoidance goals. I think intrinsic motivation or parents supporting intrinsic motivation, encouraging your best effort, right? And encouraging you to dive in and give your full effort even if you fail I think it's gonna lead more toward mastery goals and more approach goals. So these, are, these fall into the category of the why and the reason behind goal adoption, and they make a lot of difference in how the goals are experienced, right? So if you have intrinsic motivation behind a performance of approach goal, it's gonna feel more positive. It's gonna allow you to engage in, in an in-depth way to dive in and not be distracted. However, if you've got extrinsic motivation, you're worried about if I don't do better than others, my parents are gonna get on my case, right? Or I'm gonna, they're gonna be ashamed of me. Then that same goal looks, looks problematic, right? It's gonna be causing distraction because of the underlying source of it. Well, thanks very much to everyone for your questions. I'm gonna turn the program over now to Dr. Xiaodong Lin uh, for final remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Elliot, for a, a very inspiring talk. And um, what I want to focus on is what kind of a challenges this body of work has presented to the future researchers, especially you all. You are the future. We're old, we're, we're gone, you know. And so what should you carry on from this body of work? So I want to say Andy's work has pushed work on achievement motivation to the furthest possible you can get, especially using skill measures. And he published a lot of work in the different journals about to testing the, these variables and the, to prove their reliability and their validity. So this is really solid work. So um, as we, we, we heard, the major take home message is that avoidance uh, uh, goals are bad and especially performance and a mastery avoidance and the performance avoidance is even worse. So what I think uh, another big message I got is that we really need to embrace failures. We need to embrace mistakes and love it. Okay, it all sounds very, it sounds great. But lately, I have the pleasure of working with Congress of Neurosurgeons. And I realize in this whole field, if you say failures are okay, mistakes are totally welcome, we love it. Do you want to be that patient? <laughs> so what I learned from these people, they're highly stressed and that their whole goal is to avoid failures, avoid mistakes by profession, by training. So how would these, how, what kind of a challenge does this theory propose to situations like that? So, then, uh, so what I want to say is that we need to test these models in a variety of a situational specific uh, contacts and the humans, as Dr. Elliot said, when the resources are very scarce and that may be a very different situation. So I want to uh, challenge, challenge you to think about situational and context specific settings for these theories. And another challenge he proposed to us to how can we convince schools and parents and uh, uh, principals and the leaders and the uh, failures are really great. 
So think about when we were, uh, I, what I learned is that the hardest thing to convince people is to have them to buy your ideas and or to take money from other people's pocket. So these are the two difficult things, to buy, to put your ideas into other people's head and to take money from their pockets. So I say that how to encourage them to buy you ideas that failure is really great, especially in medical school that we're going to deal with. And that's gonna be really hard. And, uh, and another thing is that we really need to know uh, how can we prepare kids to embrace failures. So after studying failures for the past many years, I just realized not everybody is ready to deal with failure or born to handle the failures. And, uh, and the one most important character we need to deal with failure is, are you open to surprises? Everyone we studied were surprised by the failures. They're not surprised by the success but surprised by the failures. So how can we prepare people to be open to the, to the surprises that was not planned and not thought of ahead of time? And finally, measurement. So I think this is for the new generation, especially with the advancement of the new technology. And so I want to challenge you to really think about what are some of a variety of a physiological behavior measures that we could bring into schools and to the research setting that really testing people's behavioral reactions to various types of failure situations. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Elliot to give us so many challenges, so many food to thought, for thoughts. Thank you so much. Again, thank you all um, for coming and participating, and please join us on Alex George and to your left at the Everett Lounge for a brief reception. Thank you. Oh, that's very nice. Very nice. Yeah, 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 yeah,